Dear students, uh, today we are recording for uh, William Wordsworth's poem, Tintern Abbey, for the first year, PG course. So let's uh, go into the poem. We already have discussed the poem in the class and we have covered things like this poem is sublime, it's about memory uh, and various other aspects of the poem like uh, here it's about uh, not first hand perception but second hand secondary perception. Uh, this poem was written in July 1798, one of the 19 poems that Wordsworth contributed to the lyrical ballads which is a manifesto for Romanticism, published along with Samuel Taylor Coleridge. The 18th century was an advocate of reason and intellect, but Romanticism stressed feelings. Not that they repudiated reason, but they wanted an even greater reason. This is a base, vulgar reason. Romantic poets like Wordsworth said, we don't want this vulgar reason of industrial Britain, we want an even greater reason. Tintern Abbey possesses a special historic value. So, there is an emotional change in the poetry of its romantic movement was the climax. Recognizing the power of nature to quicken and sustain imagination and the creative faculty of man. Pantheism and mysticism are crucial factors in this poem. The basic feature of mysticism is an attitude of mind founded upon an instinctive conviction of unity, of oneness, of likeness in all things. The instinctive conviction in the case of romantic poets came mostly out of their communion with nature, being one with nature. So in this poem, Wordsworth illustrates his philosophical beliefs. It is a philosophical song, the immanence of the universal spirit of God in all nature, which makes it alive, a communion between God's soul in nature and God's spirit in man. The chastening effect of this communion in tranquilizing and elevating the human spirit and putting it in tune with the infinite. <coughs> Mysticism in Wordsworth is inseparable from this pantheism. Okay, means God is not something that is apart from humans, but a part of nature. The cardinal doctrine is that a spiritual power lives and breathes through all the works of nature. And the emotional intensity of the contemplator can alone reveal the presence of the spiritual beneath the material. So the contemplator, the reader, the poet is equally important. Along with the interest in nature and the belief in a spiritual power in nature came a deepening interest in the common folk, the normal people and the common language of human discourse. So as all of you know and we have discussed in class, this scene is set in the river banks of Wye between Tintern and Monmouth. Wordsworth visited this place in 1793 and he is writing this poem in 1798 in between in, 19, sorry, in 1795 he was in London. And it was during this uh, time he spent in that city that Wordsworth recollected his uh, tour of the river Y. Okay, uh, so the poem opens with the speaker's declaration that five years have passed since he last visited this location. Five years have passed, five summers, with the length of five long winters. And again I hear these waters rolling from the mountain springs with a sweet inland murmur. It's uh, not a sounding cataract but a sweet inland murmur. The river is not affected by the tides. Okay, it's a soft inland, soft flowing river, not a roaring torrent or something like that. Uh, so once again do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs, which on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion. So the poet is already in a secluded state and he is going into even deeper seclusion, into a secondary phase of imagination and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. The days come when I again repose or relax or rest here under this dark sycamore tree and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts, which at this, reason, uh, at this season with their unripe fruit among the woods and copses lose themselves. They are good, growing wild. Okay, the hedges are growing wild. So Wordsworth contrasts the wildness of the uh, hedges with the cultivation, order of cultivation. Nor with the green and simple hue disturb, the cultivation disturbs the wild green landscape. Once again I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood run wild. These pastoral farms green to the very door and reds of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees. So these uh, reds of smoke are indicators of the advent of the industrial revolution. Okay, they are being 
uh, smoked in order to feed the smithies of industrial England. With some uncertain notice, as might seem, of vagrant dwellers, there are certain hermits living near the uh, river Y. Okay, so here he is mentioning them because they are the ordinary people of the lyrical ballads. They are his favorite subjects, not kings and queens and other topics of uh, neoclassical literature. Uh, so, though absent long, these forms of beauty have not been to me as is the landscape to a blind man's eye. So, in the first edition, Wordsworth had used the phrase these forms of beauty, then he changed that to these beauteous forms. I think that's very crucial. Okay, when it comes to the second edition, uh, Wordsworth rephrased forms of beauty as these beauteous forms through a long absence have not been to me. But oft in a lonely room, uh, but oft in lonely rooms and amid the din of towns and cities, I have off to them. So towns and cities refers to London and also Bristol. Bristol is the town, London is the city. Because as I have mentioned earlier, uh, Wordsworth found himself in London in 1795, uh, from February to August, and then from August to September in Bristol. He was meeting Mr. William Godwin, who was the father-in-law of Percibus Shelley. Okay, they were friends. So during this time, he struggled to accept Godwin's political philosophy, which was extremely radical. You know, uh, because Mary Wollstonecraft was the wife of Godwin, and she had a child, and she died in childbirth. And you no, know, as an answer to the urgent problems posed by the French Revolution and repression in England, before giving it up in disgust, according to his spiritual autobiography, The Prelate. So Wordsworth himself was wrestling with a deep uh, emotional and political issues. Uh, in the aftermath of the French Revolution in France in 1789. So Wordsworth was also a very young man of 23 in 1793. Please take that into consideration. I have owed to them in hours of weariness, sensation sweet, felt in the blood, okay, not felt in the brain, but felt in the body and also in the innermost core of the body in his veins, in the blood, and felt along the heart, not in the brain, but in the heart, not in the mind, but in the heart, and passing even into my purer mind even more clarified into the mind with tranquil restoration. I told you about the three-phase purification device where in each phase your mind is purified and the crystal clear water reaches the ultimate vessel. Similarly, the body is the primary vessel and the mind is the secondary vessel and the soul is the ultimate vessel. Okay, with tranquil restoration, it's a restorative. This picture is a restorative. Uh, feelings too of unremembered pleasure. A pleasure not remembered but spontaneously felt. Such perhaps as may have had no trivial influence, no trivial influence, no mean influence on that best portion of a good man's life. They totally transformed his life. Okay, so Wordsworth before nature is not the same Wordsworth as the Wordsworth after nature. So he underwent a transformation. Okay, this is a crucial concept of transformation change. His little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love, no less I trust to them I may have of another gift of aspect more sublime something even greater that blessed mood in which the burden of the mystery in which the heavy and the very weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened so a moment comes in your life or during a concert or during the composition of a poem a particular moment arrives when everything becomes clear to you the doors of perception are cleansed and you look at everything in the true light as infinite that serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on. Not hurriedly, but gently the affections, the feelings lead you. Until the breath of this corporeal frame, this body expires. And even the motion of our human blood, even the circulation of blood which was invented, discovered by William Harvey, almost suspended. We are laid asleep in body. Okay, uh, We expire, but our soul remains and become a living soul. We cease to become bodies, but become souls. While with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. We also attain a kind of uh, moksha. It is like Tiago says, Thou hast made me infinite, such is thy pleasure. This fruit of freedom thou hast carried over ways and hills and breathed into it melodies eternally and new. So we become a part of this uh, nature. So uh, this is the core concept of uh, romanticism. That's why uh, the Tintuan Abbey and lyrical ballads can be called a manifesto for romanticism. Like communist manifesto is for Marxism, lyrical ballads is for romanticism as a movement. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So let's go into the uh, second portion of this. If this be but a vain belief, if this is vain, if I am misled here at all, how oft in darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight and the fretful stir, unprofitable, and the fever of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart. How oft in spirit have I turned to thee, 
O Sylvan Y, the wanderer through the woods, how often has my spirit turned to thee? So whenever Wordsworth was distracted, whenever he was like multitasking between various things, uh, then he would take solace in the memory of the river Y and its banks through which he had talked with his dear sister. Okay, so it's a spiritual solace for Wordsworth. And now with gleams of half extinguished thought, with many recognitions dim and faint, and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. So now that picture is again uh, taking rebirth in his mind. Like I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over hills and hills when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. So the poet is composing note at the first perception of the flowers, but back home he is writing in retrospect. So similarly here also, Wordsworth is taking spiritual solace not at the primary side of the flowers, but in his secondary imagination. It's a secondary process, it's not a primary process of, okay, of registering your uh, sensual vision, okay, of your phenomenological vision. It's a, it's a second-hand uh, uh, phenomenology. While ho here I stand not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years. Suppose wherever you are in pain, uh, whenever you are in pain, you will remember some instance where you were happy and you had pleasant thoughts and suddenly your mood is uplifted and you again become happy because of the memory of those good things. And this can be reiterated a number of times. Wherever you are, whenever you are sad, you can keep on reminiscing these good memories and they will keep on refreshing your mind and purifying your soul. So like you are what you eat, you are what you think. If you have good thoughts, you will have a good mind and a good soul and a good body. Okay, so always having good thoughts, good memories, good spirits. That's what uh, Wordsworth essentially is uh, saying here. It's a picture theory of mind because this was the days before photography or videography or anything like that was invented. Uh, so uh, poetry was a way of uh, recording images. It's deeply pictorial. I've told you about ekphrasis. So poetry contains these images which we call uh, ekphrasis, pictures of the mind. Okay. And at the same time, he was also perplexed. We don't know what was the cause of his perplexity. That's deeply subjective. We don't know that. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. He speaks of and somewhat of a sad perplexity. Hmm? That in this moment, there is life and food for future years. And so I dare to hope. He dares to hope. He just doesn't simply hope, but he dares to hope. Uh, though changed, no doubt, from what I was when first I came among these hills. He has transformed as a person. When he came here in 1793, he was a young deer, a raw, uh, that was, you know, bounding with joy amidst these lakes and rocks and trees and natural landscape. But now he's a grown, mature young man. Okay, his mind is more uh, intellectual. Uh, so, when like a row, I bounded over the mountains by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams wherever nature led more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. Okay, so a deep process of spiritual conversion has taken place. He is no longer that wild creature that was animated with sensuous pleasures and sensual beauty. Now he has, uh, those things have distilled from his sense organs into his deep core of his soul. Uh, so they have transformed him and enriched him and he has become a man, okay, but a raw from animal to human. So this is a deep process of transformation. Wherever nature led more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. Uh, for nature, then, the coarser pleasures of my boyish days and the glad animal movements all gone by. So he has become a man, no longer a boy. That's why this is called a spiritual autobiography. To me, was all in all, I cannot paint what then I was. He cannot truly give you a picture of himself as a young person. The sounding catch right haunted me like a passion. The waterfall haunted him. Like, you know, uh, like something ineffable, something sublime. The tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and the gloomy wood, the colors and the forms were then to me an appetite. They were feeding his crude, sensual nature, a feeling and a love that had no need of a remoter charm. He was not asking for higher intellectual pleasures. He was only asking for the base pleasures of taste and touch and sensations by thought supplied or any interest unborrowed from the I, everything was visual, everything was auditory. Okay, that time is past. Okay, that Wordsworth is not this Wordsworth. And all its aching joys are enough no more. So those joys which carried with them a sweet kind of pants are no longer there. And all its dizzy raptures, all its 
fantastic ecstatic pleasures are gone not for this faint eye nor moan no murmur i have no regrets okay i have no regrets because uh, those things are lost other gifts have followed i have received other gifts through the course of time in the course of time through the passage of time he has lost certain things but he has also gained certain intellectual gifts okay he has lost memory but he has understanding so when you are young your memory is understanding when you are old your understanding becomes memory for such loss i would believe abundant recompense this is not just enough recompense but abundant recompense for what he has lost he knows he has become a very you know connoisseur like person of taste he can enjoy certain things intellectually in his mind not only through the senses uh, for i have learned to look on nature not as in the hour of thoughtless youths but hearing often times the still sad music of humanity he is not just uh, spending uh, wasting his life but he is uh, meditating upon the still sad music of humanity he is not uh, you know like a spendthrift who is wasting his days but he has become more careful more measured more economical so one quality you can actually to words was uh, uh, is is economy of words he is a person who uses words in a very measured manner he is not a spendthrift with uh, you know uh, high falutin fantastic words like say shelley and i have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused so if uh, this poem the spirit of this poem could be captured in a word that is interfusion the spirit of god and man and nature and animal everything is interfused everything becomes one single whole it's interfusion of something far more deeply interfused the spirit that animates the spirit that motivates us uh, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air so the sun is sublime the ocean is sublime you won't say the ocean is a beautiful thing or the sun is a beautiful thing is a sublime sun or is a sublime ocean it's ineffable it's inarticulate and the living air and the blue sky and the mind of man emotion and the spirit that impels all thinking things or objects of all sort so this is deeply gnostic because once you rule out the presence of a kind of uh, transcendent god everything becomes divine everything in nature including man nature animal the sky the soul and the pleasures the emotions everything become divine okay uh, that's the paradox that's why his bahas perplexed and rolls through all things therefore am i still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains and of all that we behold from this green earth of all the mighty world of eye and ear both what they half create and what perceive well please to recognize so these are half perceived and half created the world is half our creation and it's half of it is really the so reality is incomplete in fact so sometimes when you play video games suppose you are riding a bike on a video game and there is a house on the side of the road through which you are riding your bike you are not supposed to go inside the house but suppose uh, for enjoyment you stop the uh, bike there and you enter the house and you go inside you will find some drawing rooms and uh, bedrooms and things like that but if you go deep inside the house there will be you know programming the house will be incomplete okay uh, the house will not be programmed by the game creator game developer reality is also like this reality is half your creation half uh, the programmers god's creation reality is itself is incomplete that's why you can change reality okay so that's what wordsworth says your eye and ear creates part of your reality the rest of it is filling the blanks that's why you have uh, filling the blanks exercises as cognitive tests because they test your cognitive ability can you fill something can you make something holistic can you make something incomplete complete this is the asymplastic power things are given to us unformed half shaped half baked and we have to recreate these padivanda objects into full baked full formed holistic gestalt objects okay that's our challenge that's the ability a poet has he he's like he has asymplastic power the secondary imagination and what perceive well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense the anchor of my purest thoughts the nurse the gate the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being so suppose uh, sometimes you are having very ideal airy thoughts in order to bring yourself back to your senses just pinch your ear lobe it's an anchoring so you need an anchor you need an anguram and for words who are this anchor is nature mother nature mother nature brings him crashing back to reality from his transcendental idealistic preoccupations uh, not uh, per chance if i were no per chance if i were not the stout should i the more suffer my genial spirits to decay so everything in nature decays that's the rule of nature everything suffers the process of entropy no per chance if i were not the stout should i the more suffer my genial spirits to decay if i did not have this kind of a pedagogy this kind of an education i might perhaps have regretted this entropy but no more 
uh, for thou art with me here upon the banks my sister Dorothy is here with me upon the banks of this fire river uh, Thou, my dearest friend, my dear, dear friend, and in thy voice I catch the language of my former heart, this is S.D. Coleridge, and read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of thy wild eyes. So Coleridge is not, uh, you know, the elite uh, gentleman, a poet laureate like William Wordsworth. He is, uh, he is someone who abused uh, narcotic substances and was wild-eyed and, you know, uncouth. Uh, and so Wordsworth is still calling him his dear, dear friend. Oh, yet a little while may I behold in thee what I was once, my dear, dear sister, and this prayer I make, knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her. It is her privilege through all the years of this our life to lead from joy to joy, for she can so inform the mind that is within us, so impress. Uh, so... It's, 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 it's love for the noble nobility of Wordsworth. Okay, who, he is an egotistic writer, but he's a noble writer. The nobility of Wordsworth shines forth through his affection and feelings for his dear sister Dorothy. With uh, quietness and beauty, and so freed with lofty thoughts that neither evil tongues, rash judgments, nor the sneers of selfish men, nor greetings, were, nor kindness is, nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life, all this rubbish, all this uh, rash noise of daily life cannot decay Wordsworth's nobler feelings for his sister and for his friend. Okay. Uh, so he might have stopped uh, loving them, but he'll never stop loving the days when he was in love with them. He was loving them. Shall ever prevail against us or disturb our cheerful faith that all which we behold is full of blessings. So he can't count his blessings when he thinks of his sister and his friend. Therefore, let the moon shine on thee in my solitary walk. There's a kind of, uh, you know, mystical imagery of the moon shining forth. It's a, you know, universal imagination of the poet. And let the misty mountain winds be free to blow against thee, and in after years when these wild ecstasies shall be matured. For Wordsworth, they have matured. And Dorothy also, they'll mature. For college also, they'll become mature feelings. Once they have matured into a sober pleasure, once they become more serious pleasures, uh, when thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms, when your mind is more spacious and capacious and inclusive of uh, different feelings and emotions are, and more well-formed, thy memory be as a dwelling place for all sweet sounds and harmonies, when it's full of uh, harmony. Oh, then if solitude or fear or pain or grief should be thy portion, with what healing source of tender joy will thou remember me? You will have bad feelings as well. But memories of me of William Wordsworth will heal you okay uh, and these my exhortations no perchance if I should be were I no more can hear thy voice no cash from thy wild eyes these gleams of past existence will thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together so called is far far away in the mind as in the body so his light is like the light from stars which have died long since so he's thinking of a uh, Coleridge and the light of his eyes and will you remember so this poem is about memory so what Wordsworth dreads is oblivion, forgetfulness. So he is uh, dreading whether they will stop loving him or if they will st stop uh, remembering him. Uh, and that I so long a worshipper of nature hither came unwearied in that service, rather say with far more love, oh, with far deeper zeal of holier love. No, will thou then, f so this love is a holy love. So uh, this, this is not a Christian poem, but here comes the Christian concept of love. Okay. Uh, no, will thou then forget that after many wanderings, many years of absence, so in this poem itself, absence plays a crucial role because the abbey itself is absent. The very title of this very famous poem is Tintian Abbey. Line compo lines composed a few miles above Tintian Abbey on the banks of the river Wye. But there is no abbey in this poem. The abbey is the glaring, gaping hall absence in this poem. These steep woods and lofty cliffs and this green pastoral landscape were to me more dear, both for themselves and for thy sake. Not for himself, but for themselves. So Wordsworth is a poet who is um, uh, wrestling with his self, with his ego, with his ahem. Uh -huh. So these landscapes and his friend and his sister help him to uh, escape his own self and reach out to the other okay the face of the other is the face of god okay the voice of the other is the voice of god so love and affection and landscape helps him to helps him to escape himself so when you're surfing on the computer the very mouse cursor is a curse it's the eye so you cannot escape the eye there is no escaping the eye so here uh, nature mother nature and uh, his friendship and his uh, the sorority his uh, you know a brotherly affection for his sister helps him escape his own ego okay uh, so uh, let's uh, discuss this further in the class so thank you so much